Good morning. Don't touch that dial. You have found the right place. This is Friendship Church. As much as it does not look like Friendship Church, it is. As you know, we are currently under restrictions in a uh, shelter-in-place order given by our governor, and we're respecting that. So we're currently right now in our home here in Sun City recording this service with pieces from previously recorded services. In just a moment, we're going to join Pastor Jim and our congregation, which we normally enjoy, in a service that was experienced previously. But before we do that, I just want to welcome you to spring. That's right. The season has changed. As I thought about that, I couldn't help but think of these words given to us by Luke in the uh, book of Acts. It reads, And Jesus yet did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. In other words, some things have changed, but some things have not. God is still in control of our universe, and we're still having seasons on our planet, and we're grateful for that. So I want you to understand that as much as a lot of the norms in your life have changed, the basics stay the same. God is God. He's in total control, and he's going to be with you through everything that you face in the next few days. So let's have a word of prayer, and let's move into our service for the day. Thanks so much for joining us at Friendship Church. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are alive and on the throne. Nothing has diminished your power. Nothing has shaken your status, and nothing has detoured in our faith, trusting in you that you are going to be our God. You're going to provide for us everything that we need. And as we enter this service today, as different as it may be, give us the freedom to sing your praises. Give us the freedom to extend our faith. Give us the freedom to receive from the nourishment that comes by way of your word. Change and touch our lives anew. We need you, Lord. We need your encouragement. We need the assurance. Let there be spring in our own hearts and lives today as we sense new birth, a new beginning, and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Now we're going to cut away and go to a previous service. Pastor Jim, lead us in worship. Please join in singing. Let's sing together. I'm so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined us as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. Now just greet one another and then you may be seated. Take your bulletins, please. The songs for the day are in there. Wonderful songs. Let's sing Great is the Lord together. Great is the Lord. He is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord. He is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord. Now lift up your voice. Now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, magnify your name, Prince of Peace, mighty God. Oh Lord God Almighty, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Oh Lord God Almighty. 
standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Oh, spread the tidings round wherever man is found, wherever human hearts and human woes abound. Let every Christian tongue proclaim the joyful sound, the Him. Oh, spread the tidings round, wherever man is found, the Comforter has come. Oh, boundless love divine, how shall this tongue of mine to wandering mortals tell the matchless grace divine? that I, a child of hell, should in his image shine. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise him. Oh, spread the tidings round wherever man is found. The Comforter has come. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. stories about my grandson, but I will anyway. Kyle's 19 months old, and we just had a couple of weeks ago the privilege of having them fly over from Tokyo, and we went down to San Diego for five days. Um, and he doesn't talk, but boy, can he express himself in a lot of ways. He puts 100% into everything, whether it's fun or if he's crying, it's the same, I mean, 100%. But when he wasn't doing very well, and he'd see Grandpa, he'd just walk over to me and he'd just raise his arms up, just like that. Well, you know what Grandpa does immediately. You just pick him right up and you just hold him and he gets quiet and he just, you know, I could do that all day long. This song kind of tells me the same thing about our Lord. We just have to do this through our hearts or with your own hands. You don't have to tell him what's going on. You don't have to explain anything to him. All he sees is a child who needs him. And today, as we sing the song one more time, I don't know what's going on in your life. You don't know what's going on in my life. 
but he knows. Not only does he know, he cares. And not only does he care, he understands. And not only does he understand, he has the answer. He has the answer. So whatever it is today, as we sing this again, just quiet your hearts before him and sing, Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. to come if they would this morning now to wait on us for our morning tithes and offerings thank you so much for your faithfulness for your generosity for your obedience to the Lord in giving God bless you as we give this morning Stand with me, please. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and today are from Ina Zerbe in memory of her nephew, Boyd Piper. We thank you today, Ina, for your gift of flowers and beauty. God bless you. Why me, Lord? Blessings I've known. Tell me, Lord, what did I ever do that was worth loving you or the kindness you showed? Lord, help me, Jesus, I've wasted it so. I know what I am And now that I know That I needed you So help me, Jesus 
my soul's in your hands Try me, Lord If you think there's a way I can try to repay All I've taken from you Maybe, Lord I can show someone else what I've been through myself On my way back to you Lord, help me, Jesus I've wasted it so Help me, Jesus I know what I am And now that I know That I've needed you so Help me, Jesus, my soul's in your hands. Jesus, my soul's in your hands. from John 6 and the verses are um, 25 to 35 they found him on the other side of the lake and asked Rabbi when did you get here Jesus replied I tell you the truth you want to be with me because I feed you not because you understand the miraculous signs, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, well, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives his life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. And Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Join me in prayer, would you please? Heavenly Father, as we've sung your praise and heard the power of your word once more announced to our lives, we give you thanks. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that we have. There may not be the things that we would desire right now, but we're so thankful for your provision. We have a place to live. We have food. We may not have the freedoms to go and do everything that we once did, but we have you and you're here. Wherever here is, you are with us. You are Emmanuel, and we thank you so much for that. Today, we're, we pray that you will bless every person that is listening and watching this telecast today and all those who are unable to do so. We pray especially for our friendship, family at Sun City. How grateful we are, Lord, for their faithfulness and their goodness to you and to those around them. Thank you for giving them strength and courage to reach out and call people and love people and wave and just be an encouragement to everyone they meet. I thank you for that. I pray, Lord, that you'll intervene in lives that are dealing with sickness and pain, 
some recently have lost loved ones. We remember Sandy Leslie, Lord, in the loss of Bill. Comfort her and strengthen her and provide for her, I pray. For others, Lord, they're in convalescent homes and rehab that are dealing with difficulties in their lives. We just pray for your presence and your power to be evident. Oh, God, show up, we pray, and bring glory to your name. Be with our ministries beyond our own doors, Lord, those missionaries and ministries we support. Help us to be faithful to them and help them in their faithfulness and their desires, oh, God, to do what you call them to do. We think of this virus and its infection around our world and even our own community. We pray for the victims of that, Lord, that you will give them healing, that you'll give doctors and nurses protection as they serve, but Lord, give them wisdom and understanding. Researchers that are trying desperately to provide a solution, we pray for that process. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you for our country, for our freedoms, for all the things that we still enjoy. Even though, Lord, we may feel hindered at this time, we need to realize just how much we really have. We give you thanks for that. In the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I was thinking about all the things that you and I are not able to do, and I was thinking about all the things we still can do. You remember those letters you've been meaning to write? Those books you've been reading to read? You remember those the contacts that you haven't made in a long time? Phone calls that you should make? How about that jigsaw puzzle that's in the closet you haven't put together? or other hobbies that you've had that you've just ignored. Friends, this is a wonderful time. It kind of takes us back to days of yore when we did not have so many facilities and conveniences and we lived a simpler life. I don't know that that's gonna be bad for us. I think it could be very good for us. Just consider that for a moment. Well, thank you for all your kind uh, words regarding our daily dose. We're grateful that they're meaningful to you and those will continue throughout this entire time and who knows, Maybe it will continue forever. I don't know. But we're grateful for your kindness, and we're so thankful that each of you are reaching out to other people and helping them as you can. None of us are in this alone. Today, we turn our attention to the Word of the Lord. We continue our study of the book of John. I'm so grateful for this book. It is wonderful, and I trust you're enjoying it already. Last week, we talked about what it means to be saved. And we continue that idea as we proceed in our study of John with the life of a disciple. You see, if you become a believer in Jesus Christ, if you accepted him as your Savior and Lord, you are a disciple of Christ. We were introduced to that concept a few weeks ago. But today we dig a little deeper as we begin to understand what that means by way of the example given to us by John the Baptist. Follow along as I read, and I trust you'll literally pick up your Bible or open your phone or your application and follow along as I begin reading from John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Enon near Salim, because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but... I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. And he is he who speaks of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of, he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not Obey the Son 
will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Chapter 4. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. Now, friends, our passage begins by telling us that Jesus was in the area of Judea. This was the region around the city of Jerusalem. Primarily, the ministry of our Lord took place in three areas of that part of the world, Judea, Galilee, and Perea. We'll be talking more about those as we proceed in our study. Now, while Jesus and his disciples were in Judea, John and his disciples were in an area of Enon and Salim. We presume that these two villages were near the west side of the Jordan River. The name Enon literally means fountain, which lends credence to the author's uh, assumption, if you will, that there was much water there, and this is why John was baptizing. We also get a little parenthetical from the Apostle John about John the Baptist. He said, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. This gives us a strong indication of things which are to come, which we'll be talking about in due course of our study. Now, there arose a dispute or a discussion, if you will, maybe it even uh, evolved into an argument, we don't know, about purification. It seems that a Jew, or maybe more than one, confronted the disciples of John the Baptist and asked him about purification. Now, this word in the original has to do with washing or purifying. It has to do with what we're being encouraged to do continually under our current situation. Just a thought, is this not what our mothers taught us to do a long time ago? Even if there was no threat of a virus, just something for you to contemplate. But as the idea of purification comes to the surface, we are to assume that it was about baptism since it's in the context of baptism. Remember, that's how we rightly interpret the Word of God, in context. And so I can imagine that possibly there was a question that arose about the purification process of baptism. Were the people baptized by John as pure as the people baptized by Jesus? Now we realize that this is kind of a silly question for those of us who understand the gospel because we know that water cannot wash away our sins. If it could, God would simply have provided a giant fire hose instead of sending his son Jesus Christ to the cross to pay the penalty. You're thinking with me, I can tell. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, I need to ask a quick fact here, and you may under, wonder why I read the first few verses of chapter 4, because of this reason. It tells us that Jesus was not actually baptizing anybody in water, apart from what John may have assumed or the Pharisees may have assumed. His disciples were, but Jesus did not. With that stated, we're introduced to some very important characteristics of the life of a disciple, and that's our message today. Though we've been introduced to discipleship in general, we're going to learn from these short verses of Scripture about the life of John the Baptist and how that emulates for us certain characteristics that are part of our lives as true followers of Jesus Christ. And the first is this. As a follower of Christ, as a disciple of Christ, you are faithful to your role. Faithful to your role. Now, John the Baptist had been given a task. He had been... Um, commissioned by God, for lack of a better word, that he was to be the forerunner of the Messiah, the anointed one. And he was to go and prepare the people for the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ. He preached a message of repentance, and those who accepted that were baptized in water to show their commitment and their faith in the process. John understood his role. He accepted it, and he continued to fulfill the purpose and the function that was given to him in the job description heaven had handed down. Even after Jesus had been introduced, even after Jesus chose his disciples, even after Jesus started mentoring them, John continued to do the job he had been given to do. There's a simple example here for us regarding our faithfulness and the role God has given us in the kingdom of God as well. Now, what your role is, I don't know. 
Furthermore, may I suggest to you, it's not mine to give you a robe. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And he will do that as you're open and available to him for that very purpose. But I want to give you some things, some questions, if I may, that may help you identify your role. For example, what is it that God has given you currently to do? Secondly, what do you sense you need to do or you find pleasure and joy in doing? And then what does your current place and status in life allow you to do? And then finally, what is it that you might sense the Holy Spirit of God is asking or prompting you to do? Now, these simple considerations will help you identify your role. And I simply want to interject here that if you're a disciple of Christ, everybody has a role. Everybody has a purpose. Like that little piece in the jigsaw puzzle, it's absolutely essential for the picture to be complete. Now, John understood his role, and he understood what he was supposed to do, and he was not confused in that process at all. The same thing must be for you and I. You see, as disciples, we understand that our role is not the same as everybody else's. There's going to be some commonalities in our discipleship, but our roles are going to be very, very different. John the Baptist wore a camel's hair garment with a leather belt around him, and he ate wild locusts and honey. I'm not suggesting that you do that as a disciple of Christ. Please, don't go there. It fit him very well in his time and his place. But your role can look very differently. I'm called to be a pastor. What I do the way I dress, the way I administer my life prohibitions and practices that God has given to me may be very different from what he asks of you. That's okay. Just accept that. It's not for you to struggle with, but for you to accept and understand your role and to be faithful to the same. John understood his role, and he was absolutely committed to do that. Now, yes, I know some of you are thinking ahead and saying, well, what about the time when John is questioning whether Jesus is really the Son of God or not? Well, think through that. The story is given to us in Matthew 11, and it tells us that John was in prison for preaching the gospel, and he's facing the, um, the situation that's literally going to take his life. He is going to die for the cause of Christ. And in these moments of uh, thought, being alone, imprisoned, no doubt he questions a lot of things, and he wants to know for sure that for sure, for sure, that Jesus is the Christ. And so he sends his disciples to ask. Now, I can't find any reason to condemn him for that, considering his situation. In fact, Jesus does not condemn him. Let me read you the words that Jesus spoke in that same setting from Matthew 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Wow. John fulfilled his role. He was faithful to the task. He did not shrink from his duties, but he continued keeping on. Now, you may be challenged. You may be questioned. You may even be perplexed in the fulfillment of your role. It's okay. It goes with the territory. Don't beat yourself up, and don't compare yourself with other people. If they don't do what they're supposed to do, that's not your business. I'm sorry. You need to focus on what God has given you to do. That's the only thing that you're in control of, is your faithfulness. I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul, the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Don't be discouraged by other people. Keep on keeping on, faithful to your role. The second commonality in our discipleship that arises from this passage of Scripture is very much linked to the first. It is confident in your calling. Confident in your calling. Note that John's ministry in this passage was being compared to the ministry of Jesus. Oh, my. That speaks to us of ego, does it not? Now, ladies, you may not struggle with this as much as we guys do, but it can be problematic. For example... I sure love to hear Mrs. Bushbaum pray. And this right after you had just offered the prayer at Friendship Church on that Sunday morning. Well, Pastor Lou, I sure enjoyed your message this morning, but I just heard Dr. Jeremiah. Can I tell you, I didn't hear anything past Dr. Jeremiah. Now, comparisons, even though they may not have intended to be intimidating, definitely can be because it challenges us, it speaks to our ego. 
And then I have to ask myself a question. So why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I ministering as I am ministering? Why am I serving as I'm serving? Is it for me and my glory or is it for God and his glory? Oh my, I must ask that question again. Is it for me and my ego or is it for God and his glory? I must be confident and cognizant of my own calling. John's words give us insight. I read them again from verse 27. A man cannot receive nothing unless it has not been given him from heaven. Let me read it again. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. Now, John is being compared with Jesus. And John understands his role. But remember, when he starts out, he is the king of the hill. He's the LeBron James of water baptism. Everybody comes to him. He's the only voice in town. And everybody's following him. All of a sudden now, people are going to Judea to hear Jesus and be baptized by him and his disciples instead of coming to John. John, aren't you worried? You're losing your game, buddy. You better step it up. But again, remember what John said. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. John understood that in the sovereignty of God, he had been called to serve in this particular function at this particular time. You remember the story. His parents were old. They were barren. And God showed up in the voice of an angel to Zacharias, declaring that they were going to have a son who would be a forerunner of the anointed one. This was not a role that John's parents had given him, even though his father was a priest. This was not a role that his peers had voted him to fulfill. This was not a career path he had simply chosen when he had the opportunity to do so. He knew that he knew that God had called him to be who he was and do what he was doing. And he was confident in that, that this calling was from above. Important to understand. Now, friends, you may have times that you're going to question things when you're going to have doubts about things. I've been there more times than I want to admit. Last Sunday afternoon, when I came home from preaching to an empty speaker's hall, we changed our clothes. I took on a task at house that I'd been waiting to do for some time. Margaret was fixing lunch, sat down in our TV room to watch something on the news or whatever and have lunch and finished up. Margaret went to clean up the dishes, and I just sat and contemplated and fell into a funk. I don't know why. I don't know what caused it, but I had not felt like this in years. It's not my norm. After a while, I fell asleep, took a nap, woke up. Nothing had changed. I was blue. I had nothing left. I felt terrible, not physically, emotionally. Well, I had to get my act together because we had company, friends from the church coming to our home for Sunday night supper. So help Margaret clean the house, do the floors, the things that you do when company's coming. People came. We had a wonderful evening. It was absolutely incredible. Enjoyed our company and we're cleaning up the kitchen and preparing for bed. And suddenly I realized I'm back to normal. What had happened? I don't know what caused it. But I do know what I begin to think about that changed it. I began to think about why I'm where I am, why I'm doing what I'm doing. It was not something that the board gave me or a friend asked me to do or because I had nothing else. God had called us to come to some city for such a time as this. That doesn't mean I'm the best in the West. That doesn't mean I'm going to make everybody happy and love me. It doesn't mean I'm going to be a success. But I love the words of Mother Teresa. She said, we are not called to be successful, but faithful. And I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul, who wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, in this case, moreover, it's required of stewards to be found faithful. And we're faithful to our role if we're confident in our calling. You see, that's the only way you're going to keep from quitting doing what God's called you to do if you're confident that your calling has come from him. 
Don't let the comparisons bother you. Don't let misinformed people discourage you. Know that you know that God has called you to be a disciple of Christ, and he's given you a role, and he's called you into his kingdom for such a time as this. He's equipped you and prepared you for this moment and this time. Your neighbors, your family could be dependent on you more than you possibly think true. So be faithful, and you can be faithful because you're confident who you are, where you are, and what you have been doing in the kingdom of God is because God called you to do the same. This is the life of a disciple. One further consideration from this passage, and that is realistic about your status. Realistic about your status. Now in John words uh, 29 and verse 30, he defines for us something that's very, very important. John simply states, when you're a member of the wedding party, you have to understand your role. You have to understand the status that you hold. You're not the bride. You're not the groom. You're a part of the wedding party. You're there not as a star, not as the main attraction. You're a support piece. You're a player. You're a participant. And for you to assume anything other than that is not only inappropriate, it's totally unacceptable. And John says, by accepting my role, these are the words he used to describe, and so this joy of mine has been made full because he understood his status. He understood the role he was to play and to challenge him that he was less important or to challenge him that the role he was playing was not nearly as significant as the role of Christ to him was ludicrous because he was saying, you don't understand. I know who he is and I know who I am. He reiterated the fact that Jesus was the bridegroom he was just a party of the bridal party, just a piece of the bridal party. I want you to think about that for a moment. Jesus is the bridegroom. What a wonderful reminder for us as members of the church, which is the bride of Christ. What a wonderful thought. What a wonderful consideration. And John said he's come down from heaven. He's not from the earth just speaking earthly things. He's speaking heavenly things, which we need to accept. And by accepting him and by accepting his words, we are declaring God to be true. What a powerful theological statement for us to understand. In essence, without accepting Jesus, we may be calling God a liar. Think on that, friend. That's some pretty heavy contemplation for us to consider. But John affirmed that Jesus Christ in his deity was one with the Father, that he'd come from the Father. He had been sent by the Father. And by accepting that, you were affirming God to be truthful. Furthermore, he described the love of the Father for his Son, and the fact that the Father had placed all things under his Son's control. Now think about that for a minute. The Father's love for his Son and his affirmation of him, and yet he asked him to lay all of that aside and come down and take upon flesh and die on the cross for your sins and for mine. Wow. No wonder we read that the father had to turn his head with his son hanging on the cross. His deep love for his son, his deep faith in his son, giving him control of all things, and yet he sent him to die for you. Do you understand your status in the universe? Do you understand just how priceless you are in the eyes of God? That he would send a son, not just his son, but a son in whom he had incredible love to die for you because of his love for you. That's your status. But let's consider our status as disciples of Christ. And we learn from John's example his words have become somewhat of a theme song of discipleship around the world. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. So basically, it's impossible for Jesus to be more in me unless there's less of me in me. It's impossible for there to be more of Jesus in me unless there's less of me in me. So how full are we of ourselves? How full do we want to be 
of Jesus, that he's in control, that he is our guide, that he is our counselor, that he is our source, that he is dominating our thoughts, that he is directing our paths, that he is perfecting our motives. How much control are we willing to give Jesus of our lives? I'm thinking of the words of a song that became popular a few decades ago, Jesus, take the wheel. Can I tell you, he's not going to wrestle it out of your hands. You're going to have to surrender it. So how does this exchange take place? Let me give you not the ABCs, but the CDEs. The CDEs. Here we go. First, confess Christ as your Lord. Confess Christ as your Lord. Confess him in your relationships, in your recreations, in your riches, Confess him to be Lord of your life and your dreams and your desires. Confess him to be the ruler of your life. Don't keep it a secret, especially of yourself. Confess it. Secondly, be die to self. The Apostle Paul declared these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he said, I die daily. Now, this is key. Hear me. It's not a one time for all. It's a continual process of dying to yourself every day because our nature our flesh wants to rise up and scream and holler and demand satisfaction. I'm reminded of the words of Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Please understand, this is not false humility. This is not self-degradation uh, or defamation. Respect who you are as a creation of God. Especially respect who you are as a child of God. But remember, you are not a spoiled child demanding in your immaturity. You're a child who loves and respects and obeys your Father, desiring to please Him, desiring to serve faithfully and confidently in your role as the disciple of His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the life of a disciple. And the E, edify the Lord in your life. Edify. That's to build up. How do we build up Jesus in our lives? Three quick ways. First, by his word. Every day. Read it. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Make his word the most dominant factor in your thinking. Secondly, by way of worship. But Pastor Lou, I can't go to church. You don't have to go to church to worship. Everywhere you are, anywhere you are, sing those songs that you know. Old songs, new songs. Turn on that Christian radio station and become a member of the choir. Turn on those Gaither videos that you've watched a thousand times. Do it again. And just let the lyrics of those old hymns come to the surface of your mind and slip from your lips in the morning, at night, all day long. Give him praise. Give him thanks. Give him first place in your life. And finally, the E or the third part of the E, edify the Lord in your life by way of your testimony. You're going to be asked, your neighbors are going to ask, you're going to see them at the store when you have to run get something. So what are you thinking about this current situation? Are you afraid? Tell them of your faith in God. Tell them of your confidence in the one who's ultimately in control. When they ask you, what are you going to do if you get the virus or a member of your family gets the virus? Tell them. Tell them of the great physician who heals and restores and who has power over every disease. When they ask you about your future and how uncertain do you feel about what that may look like, tell them of your walk with Christ. Tell them of your experience in the faithfulness of God that he will not fail. He's not going to fail you now. And you can trust him no matter what life may bring. This, my friend, is the life of a disciple. Faithful in your role, confident in your calling, and realistic about your status. But today, you may have to say, Pastor Lou, I'm not a disciple because you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Friend, this is the perfect day to do that. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you're in control, that we can trust you, that we can believe you, that we can know, Lord, that in spite of what life brings, 
you are always the same. And you're going to be there for us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll just help us right now to know that we are disciples of yours, to confirm that in our hearts and lives. If we've accepted you as Savior, that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are the Lord most high in our lives, and we're living for you, and you are living through us to your glory and honor. And for those, Lord, that have maybe never accepted you, I just pray, Lord, that you'll help them right now in all the uncertainties that surround them to know for certain that you are there, that you are real, that you are God, that you really did send your son, that you love so much, but you loved them that much as well. And you gave your son to die for them so that you could have relationship with them for all of eternity. Help them to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And right now, help them just to simply pray, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Change my life. Come and take control of me and fill me with confidence in my role. Fill me in confidence with my calling. And give me understanding of my status in the kingdom of God and my place in the body of Christ. You'll do it, Lord, if they'll ask, changing their life for all of eternity. How I thank you for that. Now, Lord, please be in control. Please help us. Please be what no one else can help, what, me, what no one else can be in our lives. We face tomorrow with so many unknowns, but we face it unafraid. You are God. You will always be God. And we thank you for that. Thank you for helping us understand who we are, as we continue to open our hearts and minds to your word and to your spirit in Christ's name. Amen. And now may the peace of God, our father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship and power of his Holy spirit be with you now and always. Amen. God bless. Goodbye.